Infections caused by mycobacterium abscesses appear to be increasing, particularly in these difficult to treat immunocompromised patients. They are very challenging to treat, and antibiotic options uh, in these cases are very scarce. Prolonged therapy is sometimes needed, and new options are desperately required right now. In this episode of the podcast, we will discuss this important topic with experts in the field. Welcome to Editors in Conversations. The objective of this podcast is to discuss and define mycobacterium abscessus as an opportunistic pathogen, comment on the intrinsic phenotypic characteristics of these organisms, mycobacterium abscessus, including resistant to common antimicrobials, and discuss the treatment approaches and rationale for these strategies. This episode of the, is brought to you by the Antimicrobial Agents and Chemotherapy Journal, available at aac.asm.org. I'm your host, Cesar Arias, Editor-in-Chief of AAC, and this podcast is supported by the American Society for Microbiology that publishes AAC. If you plan, you plan to publish in AAC and you become a member ASM members, American Society for Microbiology members, will get up to 50% of discounts in publishing fees. Um, for this, we visit asm.org slash membership to sign up. Don't forget also to check our latest issue of AAC with really outstanding papers on mechanisms of resistance, pharmacology of antimicrobial agents, epidemiology, and clinical therapeutics, among others. We have very distinguished guests, experts in this field today. Um, I'm, I'm very happy to introduce Dr. Kelly Dooley, who is Professor and Addison B. Scoville Chair in Medicine and Director, I'm saying new Director of the Division of Infectious Disease in the Department of Medicine at Vanderbilt University Medical Center. And she's proudly an editor of AAC. Dr. Chuck Daly, who is Professor and Chief of the Division of Mycobacterial and Respiratory Infection at the National Jewish Health, and Dr. Thomas Dick, who is Professor at the Center for Discovery and Innovation, Hackensack Meridian Health. Welcome to the program, guys. Thank you. It's good to be here. So, excellent. So, let's discuss this. This is, this is a really interesting and very important topic for all practicing clinicians out there because these this infections with these organisms are becoming really a total nightmare. So let's just start with Dr. Dick. So let's introduce this organism, Mycobacterium abscessus. I know you're going to tell us about the different species and what makes these guys such good opportunistic pathogens. Okay. Uh, I think to start with, Mycobacterium abscessus is a cousin of, Mycobacterium, of infamous Mycobacterium tuberculosis. And of course, we all know that Mycobacterium tuberculosis causes the lung disease tuberculosis which kills a million people per year. Uh, Mycobacterium tuberculosis is an obligate pathogen, an obligate parasite, uh, and uh, it's, it's, it's very serious issues. Of course, there are more mycobacteria out there than only Mycobacterium tuberculosis, and they are in general called non-TB or non-tuberculous mycobacteria or NTM, and Mycobacterium abscessus is such an NTM. Uh, there are about 200 species, Mycobacterium species, belonging to this non-TB group. And most of them are soil bacteria that live in water, uh, and they are saprophytes. And some of them are opportunistic pathogens, and Mycobacterium abscessus is one of those. Uh, now, the big difference between therapy of tuberculosis and Mycobacterium abscessus lung disease, and can also cause lung disease, actually similar to tuberculosis. The big difference in terms of therapy is for mycobacterium tuberculosis. For tuberculosis, we have actually a working chemotherapy. We can cure tuberculosis, even drug-resistant tuberculosis. And that is not the case for mycobacterium abscessus. Uh, we have a handful, two handful of repurposed drugs, uh, but they are clearly underperforming uh, a reliable curative regimen for the treatment, for the cure, of mycobacterium abscessus lung disease is not available. Therapies can take many months, drag on for years with very poor outcomes. Um, so it's clear that we need urgently uh, more and more efficacious, uh, better tolerated drugs. Uh, so of course the question is, why why don't we have them, right? So what's, what's wrong with mycobacterium abscessus? Uh, 
And here, there's really the hallmark, I would say, for my, of my Kutim abscesses is uh, that this is that this species presents perhaps one of the uh, bacteria with the most extreme intrinsic drug resistance. So intrinsic drug resistance means if you throw all kinds of antibiotics at them, uh, they just don't work. And uh, that, uh, so where does this come from? And, and uh, abscesses is really a super expert in mechanisms dealing with antibiotics. It starts off with an impermeable cell envelope. We have two membranes, the inner membrane and the outer membrane, similar to the gram-negatives, which makes actually drug penetration very difficult. We have pumps that can pump out antibiotics. Uh, perhaps most importantly, uh, microbiome abscessus can essentially metabolize or modify and therefore inactivate all kinds of antibiotics, beta-lactams, uh, tetracyclines, aminoglycosides. Uh, it can just basically eat up most of the antibiotics. And that's a major mechanism of intrinsic resistance. It can also modify targets of the antibiotics so that the antibiotics can't bind anymore. And finally, some of the targets are simply different structurally because abscessus is quite distinct evolutionary from the gram-negatives and the gram-positives, and the drugs just don't bind. Right? So we have a multitude of, of, of intrinsic resistance mechanisms. So to briefly address the question, why is it such a great or good, successful opportunistic pathogen, I think uh, the molecular mechanisms, why it can actually thrive in humans, this is still work in progress. But I think simply put, it's, it, takes, it makes use of the opportunities. Uh, so NTMs are present ubiquitously in the environment, in the soil and water. And I think they're particularly good in, in growing in our water supply systems. For example, when you take our shower heads famously, they are full of NTMs. And if you take a shower, you form aerosols. So basically, abscessus and NTMs in general, uh, they are able to make frequent contact with humans. So as long as you are a healthy individual and your lung functions are good and you have an intact immune system, your lungs can expel the inhaled, the inhaled bacteria, you're fine. Your, your lung macrophages can eat them up, you're fine. The problem starts once you have impaired lung function. So people with uh, pre-existing lung damage or uh, pre-existing lung conditions like cystic fibrosis, bronchi excesses, uh, they have impaired lung function, they form mucus. Yeah, yeah, Tom, Tom, sorry to interrupt. Uh, we're going to talk about a little bit more of that, and I mm -hmm. think we're going to leave it at that for now. Um, again, thank you for this, you know, comprehensive uh, explanation, um, because, you know, I want to move on and, and, and let Dr. Dooley talk about uh, yes, linking up what you just said about what are the clinical scenarios, Kelly, that we are likely to see um, these organisms infecting patients. Yeah, that was a that was a very nice uh, introduction. So, so thank you for laying it out so nicely, and 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 really just pointing out that these um, that these organisms are ubiquitous, and they're in your shower, and so people are being exposed to them all the time in the soil, in the water, um, and so. Um, the epidemiology has changed a bit over time. It seems like these infections are becoming more common. It's unclear whether that is because the diagnostics are better and we're just finding them more or if actually NTM infections are more common. There is some geographic, there are some geographic differences among NTM. Um, in Asia, for example, M. abscessus species are more common than perhaps in, um, in other places in the world. But, um, but, but as he said, you know, most of us do find with M. abscessus being, being around us, but um, there are people that are, have a special susceptibility and that is largely among people that have, um, that, that have some sort of uh, damage to their lungs. So they're, they're either they have structural lung disease and so that's a place for the mycobacteria to set up shop and they don't have good um, blood supply and immunologic function in these damaged areas of the lung. Or their, um, or their airways are damaged in such a way so that they can't expel these bacteria out. Um, so those would be people with cystic fibrosis, um, as, as he mentioned earlier. So people with structural lung disease are, are primarily the people that are most at risk for this respiratory 
pathogen. There are all other clinical scenarios. Mostly we talk about pulmonary lung disease, whether it's cavitary disease or nodular disease, um, but people can get skin and soft tissue infections, um, bone disease, but it's largely the pulmonary disease that most clinicians are, are going to see. Fantastic. Um, Chuck, you are a world expert clinician on this and these organisms. Um, and I know that they are not all the same. There are different what we call subspecies. So can you tell us about that and, and why it's so difficult and that some species may, may, may not respond to certain antibiotics? Yeah, please don't remind me that I'm a world expert in this because <laughs> um, this is a tough area. Yeah, I think this is a very important concept. And unfortunately, laboratories in the U.S. don't help us very much because many laboratories don't provide you with the subspecies. So they'll tell you it's in, uh, obsessive complex, and it's not even a complex. It's a collection of subspecies, not species. So this is something I hope everyone takes away is that, you know, you need to talk to your labs. You need to get the information that is going to help you as a clinician uh, treat your patient. So you've got three subspecies. Uh, obsessus subspecies obsessus, subspecies Baletii, and subspecies Massiliens. And the reason it's important to understand this is that they really don't respond the same uh, to treatment. And that's because of uh, in the setting of Baletii and obsessus, they have an active ERM41 gene. This induces macrolide resistance. Um, and unfortunately, their culture conversion rate is very low, uh, sustained conversion around 25%. But if they have Massiliens, now, uh, this, is a, this is an infection we feel we can cure. We see culture conversion sustain about 80%. That's up where we see with MAC. So it, it really makes a difference if there's a functional ERM gene or not. So if your lab can't tell you about the subspecies, they have to tell you about whether there's inducible resistance or not. Okay, so just following up on that, just the audience probably not very familiar with what are the main drugs that we are we have to deploy against these organisms. Can you expand on that, Chuck, for a, for a bit? Yeah. Um, this is why it's a problem treating. We don't have many drugs to treat this. And I think uh, Thomas uh, outlined that very nicely. I mean, abscessus is uh, resistant in vitro to almost all classes of uh, antimicrobials. And even the ones that we use, they have modest activity most of the time. Uh, mainly what we're looking at when we're uh, developing a regimen, for example, would be amikacin. Amikacin has a good activity against this drug, but not as good as it needs to be. Uh, the carbapenems, uh, imipenem tends to have more activity than marrow, which has more uh, than uh, other carbapenems. Uh, among the cephalosporins, the only one that has uh, any activity is uh, cefoxidin, uh, at least by itself. And uh, those are antimicrobials that we, most of us use. Uh, tigacycline has very good in vitro activity, but uh, a lot of toxicity can be hard to use. Uh, and so some of us have been turning to uh, other cycling derivatives like omatocycline um, and sometimes the ravacycline, uh, which also have very good activity similar to tigacycline. Uh, then the problem comes when we have to use oral drugs because this is where we don't have a lot of options. Uh, we hope it's macrolide susceptible, and of course, we would use the macrolide, usually azithromycin. Uh, clofazamine has good activity against abscessus. Uh, it can be difficult to get, but we use it in pretty much all of our abscessus patients. Um, and then we start going into things like bedaquiline, tadizolid. Uh, uh, sometimes they're susceptible. But like with most of these organisms, calling it susceptible and resistant is a relative thing. Uh, it, it, it just doesn't always correlate with clinical outcome. Okay, this is great uh, information. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Dick, so you 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 spend your time trying to develop new drugs and develop drugs for for this. We just heard, you know, we have several drugs that may or may not work very well, but uh, but uh, you know, I think discovering new drugs is important. So. <clears throat> Tell us what are your approaches and what you are finding out in the lab and potentially uh, of possibilities to discover new drugs or potentiate the ones what we have. Yeah. Uh, so basically, I think there are three fundamental approaches to, to, to finding new drugs for abscesses. Uh, one is, of course, repurposing. This means we should continue to look at drugs which are either approved or in development for other diseases, whether they may be useful to to, for, for use against microbiome abscessus. And here comes to mind 
no, novel, for example, oral beta lactams like oral tepipenem, which is in development for other diseases, together with oral avibactam. Uh, so we should continue looking for drugs which are advanced in clinical development for other diseases for their usefulness. And I think specifically in the beta lactam field, there may be opportunities for that. The second fundamental approach is what, what, what can be called repositioning of, of existing drug classes. And that actually uh, basically tries to optimize drugs which in principle work, but they have issues. Uh, a very nice example is the, are the macrolides that Chuck mentioned, ERM41 um, is a resistant mechanism, resistant mechanism that met methylates the binding site. So if we could find basically macrolides that bind despite having the, the, the methylation on the ribosome, that would, that would make a new drug. So this is what we can do, a chemical optimization to circumvent that. Another possibility would be, we know that rifamycins are work, do work very poorly because they are metabolized by, by the bacteria. If we can block this metabolism, we may actually come up with working uh, rifamycins. We also have them to address the drug drug interaction. But this is basically repositioning. So you take drugs that are approved, that work, but they have issues to try to make them better. And the third fundamental approach would be then de novo drug discovery. And that means that we really find new chemical entities with or without a novel target or an old target. And here it turns out that actually we can really exploit the success of, uh, of TB, of tuberculosis drug discovery over the past 20 years. So the NTM drug discovery is pretty much in a state that TB drug discovery was in 20 years ago. There is not much activity. We have very few leads, lead, lead hits, leads, advanced leads. Uh, but what we can do now is we can actually exploit chemical uh, matter that was generated in TB drug discovery project to generate hits or even advanced leads for directly testing in vivo models in, against abscessors. So I think that is a very promising approach uh, where we can sort of fast track uh, microbiome abscesses or NTM drug discovery by using chemical matter that was generated for tuberculosis. And these are essentially the three approaches we are, and I think the field, uh, are following up. A beautiful uh, description on this. Um, so le let's make this more practical. So Kelly, so if a, if a patient comes to you to start therapy, so, and you are consulted, you are in an AD service and somebody calls you to, to, to treat this. Um, I'm going to have a chalk follow up as well. Um, so what are, how, how do you, how do you approach the patient? Uh, do you call the lab for the uh, speciation and what kind of drugs do you t tend to use to start with in these patients? Well, I mean, I think I think Chuck is a better person to answer this, having um, decades of experience trying to sort out drugs for patients. But I, I mean, I think the basic principles are that um, you're working with the lab and hopefully you have some information, although this is a mycobacterium and it doesn't grow in the same way E. coli grows, um, it still is much faster growth than with TB. So you might get some information about susceptibilities a little earlier rather than later. And in general, it's not an emergency to start to start treatment. So you have a little bit of time, which is a little is, is a bit different from TB or other um, infectious diseases to pick the right antibiotics if you can get any information from the lab about susceptibility pattern. And then if you're thinking about a regimen, I mean this isn't these regimens don't aren't built in the same way TB regimens are in that you don't have one with bactericidal activity and, and this one with sterilizing activity and that one to present prevent resistance of the others and this to to you know kill bugs in this certain compartment, which is how we kind of put together um, TB drug regimens, it's more, what do you think the patient can can tolerate? So there's a lot of uh, consideration of comorbidity. So if you're going to start someone on IV amikacin, but they already have kidney disease or they have trouble hearing, then you have to take into consideration these um, comorbidities and other medicines people are taking. Um, they're going to require IV access and long-term 
treatment with the with the, at least probably a couple of IV antibiotics for a while, and then you throw in a couple of these um, oral agents to try to make a regimen. And I think a lot of time, I'm sure a lot of your time check is spent just accessing some of these medicines and ensuring that they're paid for in some way. I mean, this is really uh, one of those critical areas of unmet medical need where patients really suffer and the drugs we have are, are pretty toxic and, and don't work very well. And we, we definitely can do better. I I love that. Um, I mean, Thomas Dick, a lot of his work is actually published in AAC. So I see a fair bit of it kind of early on, which is nice. But um, I'm glad to see there is some discovery work and um, and repurposing work, at, at, at least on the bench and now even in, in some trials to, to help us do better. Yeah. Uh, very important points. Um, um, so, Chuck, wa walk us through your your process, your thought process when you um, get uh, a patient with this disease. And so, what do you da do? You know, in practical terms. How do you? What do you ask your lab? What drugs you start first? Maybe second. What considerations are that as as you know as a follow up from from Kelly's important comments? Yeah, well, I agree with everything Kelly said, and the, I'll take a step back. The hard part is, are you going to treat the patient or not? Uh, and, and then once you get past that, it actually is fairly cookbook, you know, if you follow the guidelines. Anyway. So how, how do you decide? Very important. How do you decide you need to treat or not? Well, I would say with all NTM, not just obsessives, but probably particularly with obsessives because it's so difficult to treat. Um, we look at, is the patient symptomatic? Uh, what's the extent, uh, radiographic extent of disease? Do they have cavitation, for example? Um, what's the bacterial load? Um, is, is this a positive lavage only? I haven't treated anyone for NTM from a, with a positive lavage only in probably 20 years. Uh, I, I mean, it just tells me I better start looking harder now. And so we get sputum, and we like to get several different sputum cultures, preferably over weeks to months. Uh, we, I, I, what, um, Kelly said, you know, you can take your time with this, this disease. This is not TB. Uh, you want to be very certain that this is harming your patient. You know, the other thing that we find is in those people who have a single lavage with abscesses, when we get three sputum, it actually, they, they all grow MAC or they grow some other uh, slow grower. So mixed infection is very common. So the first thing I would say is to slow it down, get your diagnostic specimens, get them to a lab that is going to provide you with clinically useful information. And if you look at the patient and they're symptomatic, they have risk factors for progression like cavitary disease, then we're going to recommend treatment. Uh, we start usually with uh, three or more drugs in macrolide susceptible disease and four or more in uh, resistant disease, usually two IV drugs uh, with as many orals as we can get. And uh, how long you, you can treat that is, I mean, we don't know. When we did the guidelines, uh, we had a PICO question that we asked the uh, expert panel. How long do you use the IV the drugs? And so we went around the room and the, uh, some said two weeks, some said nine months. So we said, well, we've got some discussion here because we have to somewhere. <laughs> That's the typical three. expert panel, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. But most people treat it around two months, uh, but let's say two to three months. And, and then we go to the next phase in TB, you know, the continuation phase. We use the same terminology. Uh, but now it's tough because, as I said earlier, we just don't have many oral drugs. And to Kelly's point, the ones that we want, we often cannot get or we can spend weeks or a month or two prior authorizations, you know, trying to get drugs that have activity in vitro. Um, because that's mostly what the data that we work with in this field. Um, so it, it's a, it's hard, and it really turns doctors off. They do not want to go through all of this. And so abscesses is often the one. Pulmonologists, they make the diagnosis, and as soon as they find out it's abscesses, they're sending them to their ID colleagues because they're going to need IV medicine, and they don't want to deal with it. So it really is the infectious disease uh, practitioners that are treating abscesses. Uh, in the past, it was really more pulmonologists treating MAC. Uh, but obsessives has really pushed NTM, I think, into the IE practices. So great. Um, so, uh, Tom, uh, you mentioned about, I mean, I'm very curious because and there's uh, several papers in AAC, uh, particularly one of the first uh, 
of, of talking about beta lactams, and per, particularly the beta lactam inhibitors like Avivactam and all that. Can you comment a little bit more about that? Uh, and I know even in TV they are they are being considered, particularly multidrug resistant. Uh, I, I think there, there there is huge potential, right? I mean, there are a couple of papers published that looked at some beta lactams and some beta lactamase inhibitors and combinations of dual beta lactams. And I think there can be much, much more done. I mean, we just recently added to this to this beginning analysis, and and we we found that, for instance, uh, you know, tebipenem combined with amoxicillin uh, together with a, with abibactam has uh, has great synergy in bactericidal activity. And I think the more systematic analysis uh, will reveal. More beta lactamase inhibitors and more and more beta lactams in combination uh, that may be useful. Of course, the problem that we are facing a little bit in the drug discovery area is that uh, that the animal models are a bottleneck, right? So we have you know we have a mouse model which is largely immunocompromised or immunodeficient, so the predictive value is limited. However, with the beta lactams which are in the clinic. Because many of the beta lactamase inhibitors and beta lactams are in clinical development or they are already in the clinic. So we could actually shortcut this and get around the limitation of the animal model by going from in vitro di directly to patients because we have the clinical data uh, for, from the other trials. Right? So I, I'm very hopeful that a more systematic analysis of the currently existing beta-lactams, either in development or already approved, together with the beta-lactam inhibitor, beta-lactamase inhibitors, will result in some useful therapies. I'm quite optimistic. Yeah. Chuck, uh, Kelly, any comments about this beta-lactam, beta -lact newer beta-lactamase inhibitors and promise for, for these infections? Go ahead, Kelly. No, I was just going to say there, there are some people who really believe in this the dual beta lactams because they they hit different targets, and so I think you mentioned that Thomas that there's some synergy there when you're using dual beta lactams oh. along with the beta lactamase inhibitor. Uh, so I think a lot of people are enthusiastic about testing that. Yeah, and I think uh, sorry when I just briefly intervene, and I think the property that beta lactams are bactericidal. I really think that's important for obsessive disease because, because we have the problem that the immune, either the immune system is compromised and can't do the job, or we are in a, in the local environment where the human immune system doesn't have access in the mucus, mm -hmm. right? So basically, we can't do what we usually do, that we give antibiotics, and even if they're mostly static, the immune system will finish the job. I, I, at, at least I believe that bactericidal antibiotics are really important, and beta-lactams are, of course, supercidal, right? Megacidal. So, I, I was just going to say, Cesar, that we, we use dual beta-lactams uh, in J um, with our abscesses. We particularly use them in some pretty severe cases, extrapulmonary, like uh, spinal infections um, and uh, cavitary disease. You know, anecdotally, I've seen some almost miracles. Uh, I, you know, I, I worked, we've been working with Dr. Bonomo at Case on, on some studies. We published a couple of things with him. Um, and with, with a few groups in the country, we're trying to put together some case series just to give us a better idea of what we're seeing when we use it. And w just to be specific, we use imipenem and ceftaroline. And again, it comes from work from Robert Bonomo's lab. Yeah, so that, that that's that's something that I wanted to, to, to follow up with. Um, in terms of, of you, you mentioned, Chuck, about the macro light susceptibility at a, a very important uh, point to, to, to use these drugs. So how frequently uh, you can use these drugs in your practice and how successful has it been? So, you know, the species or subspecies uh, prevalence varies. So unfortunately, in the U.S., we have a mostly subspecies obsessives. If you go to Japan and Korea, it's about 50-50 uh, mycelians and obsessives. Uh, so they're very lucky in that regard. Um, we use macrolides anytime that we, we have susceptible isolates. And unfortunately, it's only about 20% of obsessives um, and pretty much all of mycelians. And we just wish we had more. Uh, we, we do see more. We seem to see more mycelians from Florida uh, 
uh, than we have seen in some other regions uh, of the country, something we just looked at recently. Um, but if you do use a macro light, I mentioned earlier, culture conversion is around 80%. And if you don't, it's around 20 so, Chuck, there are some people, and even in the guidelines, uh, there was debate about whether to use the macrolide anyway, even if there is resistance, because this idea, it might have some immunologic activity or anti-inflammatory activity. Do you buy that? Uh, I do. I mean, three randomized placebo-controlled studies in bronchiectasis patients published in New England Journal, JAMA, and Lancet all met their primary endpoint and showed that they decreased exacerbations or time to next exacerbation. So they definitely do something. It's just what's the magic that's occurring that lets that happen? Uh, because we don't think it's antimicrobial activity. So it's some, it's probably some other activity, but I don't know what it is. But that's that's where that came from. And remember, there were a lot of pulmonologists on the on that uh, committee. Half were pulmonologists, uh, half were ID uh, or microbiologists. So they felt pretty strong about it. And they, they, they use this drug in those, some of those trials for pseudomonas but, yeah. uh, and recurrence of pseudomonas as well um, and, and seem to be working through uh, different mechanisms. So um, that's, that's a very interesting part. So um, let, let's talk about the, these, these other drugs. Uh, you mentioned the oxysolidinos, right? Um, that, mm -hmm. you know, are, are, you know, sometimes used by, in TB as one daily dose instead of two to decrease um, uh, toxicities. So um, for anybody, so what, what's the experience for linezolid or tedisolid to, to treat these organisms? Is that to me? Yeah, Chuck, let's, yeah, let's okay. go with you. Um, well, so, so I, I think we have the same issues we have with TB. The toxicity is a limiting issue when using them. Um, Tadizolid has significantly better in vitro activity, so that is a drug we would prefer to use, but to our point earlier, it's hard to get uh, through insurance. A lot of denials. I would prefer it over linazolid for obsessives. Uh, but we do use linazolid sometime, but we only see in vitro activity in, in, in our lab probably less than half the time would, would we use linazolid based on in vitro activity. Um, so... There are some new ones out there that are coming, and they they will they are more active against obsessives, and uh, we'll see if they if they have less toxicity. We're hoping they will. Okay. So are those um, are those like sutazolid and TBI two two three, or they're coming from somewhere else outside of TB? Um, you those are some, and the other one is confidential. Can't say the name, but uh, it's coming from your previous employer, meaning someone at Hopkins. Okay. Okay. All right. Great. Great. Right. So, um, and, and then the, 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 the drugs that are sort of, uh, being used more now, um, um, I guess in my experience are the new glycocyclines, like, you know, omatacycline, um, particularly omatacycline in terms that it is IV and oral potentially, but, uh, I guess tigacycline and avacycline may have also activity, um, AAC just published a paper about the MICs, for example, for etavacycline that look pretty good. Um, so, Chuck, what, what are your comments on, on, on these type of drugs? Yeah, so we, um, we're pretty excited about these drugs. Um, uh, I would say omatocycline more just because it has both IV and oral uh, formulations. It seems to be better tolerated than definitely than tigacycline. Um, we don't have a lot of clinical experience. There's a phase two randomized placebo control uh, trial that's ongoing in the US. Uh, so we should have some very good data pretty soon uh, related to its activity uh, in humans. So we're, we're pretty excited about it. The omatocycline and Tyga have a similar uh, MICs. Araba may be a dilution better, um, but again, it's, it's only an IV formulation. And when you've used it, um, what's your experience in long-term therapy? Well, you know, this this is the problem, of course, because it's one of four drugs usually, and it's difficult to to tell. For for example, in one of those anecdotes, it was a miracle to me that I started dual beta lactam, also started omatocycline. So, you know, this is this is the hard part of teasing out. But I, I, I do feel like it provides us with an active oral drug that is better tolerated than many other things that we 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 have available not many but the other things that we have available Tom 
um, in, in your research, anything that you can share us that um, is exciting in the future? Um, and I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to start talking about how about phages, for example, that people have used. And uh, so anything to comment about that? Phages. Uh, well, I mean, one comment is I'm not into phages because I'm a small molecule drug discovery person. So I may not be the expert. But of course, there have been these nice success stories. Uh, and I think, you know, in antimicrobial resistance, one needs to follow up all avenues and do not leave any stone unturned. Uh, however, what, uh, what worries me with phage therapy is the scalability. Right. I mean, there have been, I think, a few dozen patients have been treated and half of them, there was some therapeutic effect, which is, of course, great. Right. Uh, I just, my, my concern would be, but I may be wrong because, again, I'm not the expert there. Can we can we scale that up? You know, we have hundreds and hundreds of, of uh, abscessus and other NTM patients. Uh, that would be a little bit my worry. But I think it's, it's a great success and anything that works should be followed up. Any comments on phages, guys? Have you used it? Uh, we, we published a few months ago uh, in a different journal, Cell, uh, a CF patient that we dosed. Uh, I think you, the people, I would say, if you if you want to see our view of this, read that paper, uh, because we're, we, it was an unbelievable success story. And uh, and, it, and what I think makes it also interesting, uh, Jerry Nick, who led the group, and he runs our adult CF program here, He's been doing biomarker studies for NTM. And so as part of this case getting dosed, we were able to do um, biomarkers over time. And those biomarkers basically showed that we were killing the, breaking the cell wall. Uh, lamb spiked after the phage, urinary lamb spiked. Um, and um, PCR in the sputum for obsessive spike. So it was releasing DNA. So we, ha we have these biomarkers that said, yes, this is working. And then for the first time in years, he became culture negative. That allowed him to get a transplant. And now a year later, he still never had obsessus again. Great. And how, was it inhaled? Was IV? Was both? It was IV. We're, we're, you know, we work with Graham Hatful on these. And um, we're a little concerned. We're not sure what really dose is being delivered to the, to the lung when it's inhaled right now. So we prefer to do IV. Um, because we, he can tell us, you know, exactly the concentration of phage going into the vein. So, so that that's what we're doing, and maybe in the future, uh, inhale. And what, does any indication that the organism became resistant with the phage, which is the, the really drawback yeah. for yeah. these therapies? No, there was no resistance. Uh, the maybe the bigger thing is that the people are developing antibodies against the phage. So the Graham Hatful they published uh, twenty people in the U.S. Oh, the world actually who've been dosed with phage. Most had obsessus. Um, I think there was one MAC. And there were um, 11 that had some positive response. And of the ones who didn't, many of them developed antibody against the phage. And our patient was starting to develop. After a year of dosing, he started to develop, but he never fully uh, developed antibodies. Yeah, so I think the... E Sorry, Kelly. Go ahead, Dan. No, no, I was just, I was just um, very interested in what you were talking about with the biomarkers and the urinary lamb. And um, as everyone on this call knows, drug development for NTM is terribly difficult because there's just nothing to, that's validated to measure so that you understand whether the drug is working for the patient or not. And, and aside from the multi-drug therapy and picking out the activity of one in a sea of drugs, but really what are you even measuring? It's not so much what are people coughing up and how quickly their cultures convert or how they feel. And, and so having some sort of biologic marker of treatment activity is actually kind of exciting. Do you feel like that's promising? Yeah. And so he's been looking at a number of different types, you know, urine, uh, sputum, blood, uh, uh, exhaled gases, um, and all of them seem to work. It's just a matter of which is going to be the one that works the best, can be scaled up in a trial, for example. Uh, or maybe it's going to be a combination, but uh, I, I think the work right now looks pretty exciting. And look, look at that paper, and, and you'll see what I'm talking about. It's a very interesting uh, two spikes. You know, uh, something was happening to the cell wall. Yeah, 
Yeah, for, for the people who are not used with the word lamb, can you define that? Lipo, arabino, banan, I can't ever say the last part. Uh, it's a, you, you say it, uh, Thomas, because you, you know the cell wall so, better than I do. <laughs> <laughs> we need Patrick Brennan for that. Yes, that's right. That's right. <laughs> Uh, but lamb is in the cell wall uh, of uh, mycobacteria. And so if you theoretically, if you uh, somehow punch a hole or affect that cell wall, you, you should be able to measure an increase in lamb. This should also work for better lactam therapy, right? Because this should also oh. make the bacteria pop. I mean, it's fantastic that you guys are developing uh, clinical biomarkers. That's a huge gap, right? I mean, huge. And this is really super good news. And, and, and the lamb thing may be particularly useful for lytic antibiotics, right? Mm. Uh, so that's something interesting to keep in mind. Very exciting. Well, I don't remember any podcast that I've learned so much in such a short time. So I'm going to let uh, mm -hmm. Kelly uh, the last word. So what do you think is going to happen in the future with these infections? Are we going to lose? Are we going to win? Or are we going to stay the same? So, I, so I'm an optimist. I'm always, I've always been an optimist, um, but and I'm mostly optimistic because I think that a lot of really smart, dedicated people are working on this. And so from the lab side, from discovery, there are a lot of people working on new compounds from new classes and, and you know, repurposing the drugs we have or optimizing those scaffolds of, of drugs that have some activity. And then, and then there are growing networks of um, more and more centers, I think, are joining these networks and, um, and contributing patients to the trials that eventually are going to help us find better treatments. So I think in an TB drug discovery, there's just, there's a, there's a lot going on. It's a whole third wave of activity with many drug companies now being engaged in this. And so to me, it's an unprecedented time for mycobacterial infection, treatment of my, mycobacterial infections. And so, um, so, so yes, I, I think we will win in the end. It's a pretty wily foe. And, and I just, these poor patients who are suffering month after month with these terrible treatments and these just horrible pulmonary symptoms, we just, we just have to do better for them. So I, I feel good about the field and, and that, that people are really engaged in, in making things better. So... Fantastic. With that optimistic note, we are going to close the podcast. It's been really wonderful. Learn many things. And, and, and hopefully uh, this will help a lot of people. Uh, this is Cesar Arias, Editor-in-Chief of AAC, signing off.